Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the school district committee meetings for March 7, 2022. And at this time, we will open our meeting with our athletic agenda chaired by Madam Diane Glover Brown. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, right now, we'll have a presentation by our athletic director, Mr. White, and maybe the assistant, Mr. Sowers, also. Okay, thank you. I'd like to say uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you for having us here this evening uh, to review some of the athletic needs. And uh, we thought it'd be prevalent that uh, we come and see you in person tonight to go over uh, some of the things that we think could uh, highlight our 6A program, which, which York High is. And 6A, we all don't know, is, is a top uh, category in the state for high school athletics, and which York High is, York City Schools are part of. So in, your, in, you, in front of you, you do have binders uh, that, would, that you could probably follow through with us in reference to what's gonna happen on the slides. I have Mr. Sowers, my assistant athletic director with me this evening, along with Dr. Fitch and uh, director uh, Rich Muldrow. So the reason we are here to review, hopefully to get artificial turf surface on, on the backside of the uh, stadium, Presently, we have a turf field inside the stadium and the backside is all grass. As we go down there and we, especially this time of the year, um, the outfield of the softball and baseball fields are a mess, a full of geese waste. Um, we hope we know that if we turf that field and Let's, let's put it out there, it's a, it's a hazard for our children to play on, on that type of surface with all that waste down there. Uh, Mr. Muldrow was down earlier today because we, we are prepping it now, both the softball and track, uh, softball and baseball fields, we're prepping it now to get ready because today is the start of the spring sports season. And we were just talking about how bad it, the geese waste is on our fields and our kids are there uh, trying to play around that stuff. Even though we, we uh, we go over it and dig it up and try to move it away. It just keeps coming back and back and back. And it's just a bad situation for our kids to play in that type of situation. Next slide. We have one. Okay, there. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a rendering of, uh, of the field that we that I that will help benefit our, our, our students. Here is the, this is the uh, existing field. So these are the visitor stands, and this is the backfield. This is this fence right, this is a fence running that uh, field turf gave us, but we will have a fence that goes around the top layer of the, of the, of the backfield. So this fence will not be here, all right? We will not need that fence because we'll have one that goes on the rail trail and go around the back of the fence off everything, but this fence, this particular fence will not be here. So. We want to turf everything except the part here where track and field throws because that they need grass for that. So the shot put would go here, the javelin, I mean, the shot put would go here, the discus would go here, and then we still have the javelin field on the existing where the little kids play football or practice football in the seventh, eighth grade. That's where, that's where we have the existing javelin field now, and that's where it will stay. Hardball or baseball will go here, softball in this corner, and then we have another field here that we could play soccer and football. And what this does helps us, helps us and our kids, because right now we have the one field right here where we play, we play our major sports in the fall. So for instance, we have a JV football game we have that starts at four o'clock. Then we have to follow with the varsity soccer girls game or a varsity soccer boys game, which starts at that. So it'd be 5.30, I mean, excuse me, 4 o'clock. And then the next one would start at 5.30, 6 o'clock. Then our kids are getting home very late at night. If we're able to get two turf fields, we can have them both going simultaneously. We have a JV football game, a, a junior high football game, and then simultaneously have a soccer game going on, on um, at the same time, gets everybody home early, gets our kids home earlier, they're not in the streets, gets them to their studies earlier, and 
it just makes it safer from all around. So this rendering has uh, how has a skin and field, has a looks of a skin and field, but it's all going to be turf. All right. So with this low maintenance, um, no maintenance at all, no no uh, no dirt we have to put in every year because you know sometimes it lips out, dirt blows away, and grass grows in through it. So we want to turf the whole thing, and just and possibility and the possibility of putting football lines in there, not football lines where we have the numbers like on our main field because this is a multi-purpose field we have the small uh, numbers that we can put on the sides that could represent 5 10 15 yards or whatever so mr, mr. Moses, white, want to speak to any about, about mr. the mr uh, white yes yes sir question for you yes looking at your schematic where is our current baseball field our current baseball field is right here oops right here going this way okay. and our Softball field is in this corner. Okay. So our baseball, I'm sorry, it goes this way, and our softball field is in this corner going that way. So this new design is going to move the current baseball field from where it is now. Yes. But that other field where the baseball field is currently will be a part of the soccer field. Correct. Okay. I just That's want correct. to make sure I was looking at that right. Right. Rich, want to speak to um, what the uh, current field section in the grass and stuff. Okay, so when we're talking about the field, again, as we, I was here before, we are putting a fence up around the bowl. We call the big bowl and the little bowl. I have one more meeting on the 17th with the zoning because that was a little bit of a holdup. Otherwise, the, uh, the fence would have been up by now. We had a meeting with the Corps of Engineers. They are getting ready to do a big project in the back of Willis Run in our stadium, which they'll take all those trees down and we were getting a little bit nervous because of what they were talking about doing. But right now we're in good shape. So we're good with the Corps of Engineers. So in general, when you see where the hill's at, we're gonna have to put a retaining wall. This field right here, again, this is the first study. Again, we'll have football lines in there, just a football and the goal lines, uh, removable goal posts and so forth. So not only will you have JV or practice, you also have the band back there because, you know, the band practices in the back will have that lit, lit so they won't have to put in lines. This baseball field for us old school guys, this is how they usually look in the Pittsburgh and the Philadelphia um, Phillies. This will be look like a regular baseball field, which is turf. Like, that's not sand. That'll be turf. But this will be the same thing. This was their initial um, design. Dugouts 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 it'll enhance it's the one to play because when they go to other stadiums and they go to other places the first thing they say is how come we don't have dugouts how come they have this how come we're sweating to death that'll stop all that and let's get with the main problem i was down there today right this is a wildlife smorgasbord plain and simple because when we had field turf and the Corps of Engineers, they said, especially the Corps of Engineers, this is the best thing we can do to stop all the geese coming down. You don't have geese on the football field. Other schools were going through the same thing. Why? You take away their food source. But when you're down there, and they're, I had my gentleman down there today getting ready to get the field ready, Mother Nature is going to have to help us before we get to the first game of getting the waste out of there. Just, just plain and simple. Mother Nature is going to help us to get the waste out of there. This stops all of that. They have to find somewhere else to go. I've talked to all the other school districts who had the same problem. Susquehanna had that problem because where they're at. Eastern had that problem when they were putting up their field, and they're right there. And they're the, you know, that stops all that. Now, we will have a small bowl will be our uh, our grass field and we cut cost wise i'm not seeding i'm not caught you know cutting i'm freeing up my personnel they'll still be down there for other activities and other things they need to do but if you're looking at all the school districts plus the fence looking at all the other school districts in the county and i just was giving a report west stroke's looking at doing theirs and west stroke was going to be the last one they're looking at turf this will enhance this will bring, um, not even, I'm, I'm not even going to say pride, but when kids in the community sees this, plus we can use this for other activities, 
it's going to enhance what we have as a 6A program. If we're going to be 6A, if, you know, we, we got to, you know, we got to go up to 6A. Cumberland Valley just got for five years the state championships. I know the athletic director at Cumberland Valley. I know the facility director. They just, they beat out Hershey, Altoona, and they beat out Penn State because they're redoing all their facilities. And the revenue they're going to get out of that is, <laughs> is going to be you know, for all sports, football, field hockey, and soccer for the next five years. Well, and I, I like that you brought that concept up about the revenue generation, mm -hmm. but you know with the land covenant, there are certain things that we are pro prohibited from doing at Smalls Athletic Field. Mm -hmm. right. So those things need to be kept in consideration. And I know very well what we can and cannot do at Smalls Athletic Field in terms of generating funds. Yes, sir. But this right here will, you know, we talk about getting our kids out here to play. And again, during the summer, I mean, doing on a couple Sundays in the spring, we have York Little League down there. And, and I'm going to let you go because I've been talking too long. And the Rebs came down to help us redo our stadium. I mean, redo the field to get ready for baseball. They came down free of charge. They brought their, one of the best ground crews in my league football. They did a whole bunch of work for us free of charge. The next day, nice day, it was so much. It, it was like they came back. I was like, yeah, waste. It was like, well, this is what we have. And it was a shame because we had a game that next day. So this is something we need to think about because other school districts are putting turf down. And again, it stops all the feeding ground. Thank Mr. Maldrow, you. I have a question. So, um, I, I, of course, I like the concept also, but um, you mentioned the Corps of Engineers. What, was, what were they doing that there was an initial concern? Okay. And again, I, I don't like to go back into the past, but the Corps of Engineers a couple of years ago, they're getting ready to redo, what's that, Willis Run in the back? Okay, and they're going to expand that for more flood control. And again, I didn't know until they came and called me. They're going to expand that, and all those trees back there are going to get cut, and it's going to be an extension wall and cemented. So we got a little nervous on our, our when it came to flood control, because we're on a 100-year plane flood control and how much we could do because in the back back here where you have it's a um, drainage pipe underneath we're going to be good so when they found out about we were looking at some projects and some fencing they got in contact with me and we did a whole bunch of studies and stuff for your charge they said we're going to do this we're going to expand we're going to get rid of all them trees and if you ever been back there it's bad especially during the summer you can smell the poison ivy they're getting rid of all that now. That is a two-year project that was supposed to happen three years ago. But again, now it was a different group. It was pushed back. Now they're going forward because they like what we're getting ready to do. We're in good contact with them. We've already sat and met with them twice. Um, so when they do their project, it will not affect anything as small as field. As a matter of fact, it will enhance it because you'll clear out all them trees all the dead weight back there. And again, because right now the Corps of Engineers, when they want to do a project, they're going to do it. And that's all there is to it. Mr. Muldrow, I'm glad that you talked about Willis Run. Diane and I grew up by Willis Run. And when Agnes hit in 71, we had to leave. Mm -hmm. 72. 72. 72. Yeah, 72. My brother was turning I one. Was on, that I was day. on Princess Street then. <laughs> My baby brother was turning one that day. But when Agnes hit, we had to leave our neighborhood and move out because of the floodwaters. And for those of us who remember Smalls Athletic Field, uh -huh. right, that, all of that was underwater. Yep, I remember. All of that was flooded. It was underwater. So I'm hoping that the Corps of Engineer will be able to make sure that they widen that so that we don't have that flooding that was down there before. Now, they're not starting their project. Again, they're in their feasibility studies. This is something they should have did a while ago. They're not starting like tomorrow. It may be this year. It may be next year. They're still doing all that stuff. So we could do this and have this in. We're still safe and covered. But again, they're not doing anything now. They're just doing their studies. With the amount of floodage that happens down there when we have heavy floods, will the drainage system be adequate enough to drain the water off in time so that the field is not submerged? It should be. They should be? It should be. 
if we put in a retaining wall, we put in a retaining wall and a drainage, what they're going to do here, we won't have what we've been having in the past. Again, this past couple of storms, we had a couple of hiccups on the field where some water got through, but that's everywhere. But everything else was smalls, especially the football field. You know, it, it stood the test of time. It handled it. This right here, especially when we're getting rid of this hill, a retaining wall here will stop a lot of the flooding in our area. So when we're talking about all these retaining walls and we're talking about the fencing going up, will there still be area back there for people to walk? Oh, yeah. We have nothing to do with the rail trail. OK, we have because nothing I know to that do with that. One of my neighbors asked me that question just no. before I came And that was brought up by the Corps of Engineers. So they were asking, well, what about the rail trail in the city? Is we have nothing to, our fence and everything has nothing to do with the rail trail. It has nothing to do with it. Okay. This is on all our property. Now, well, he was, uh, Mr. White was bringing up about this fence right here. That's something they threw in. They knew about when we were talking about our fence here. We can still keep that there. They're in the cost, but we don't need it. And then there's some other things we can take out of there that our department can do ourselves that we can cut some costs. But again, I'm going on the 17th with you know zoning. That was the only hiccup we had with the fence. The fence would have been up by now, but it was some complaints from some folks about why we're putting the fence up. So I'm going to zoning on 630 and you know, plead our case. Dr. Fitch is going along with me. I was told we're going to be fine. But this will cover that with our safety issues. And again, why do all this work? And then we have cars and stuff. Because right now, um, my question to you is this. Who has an issue with what we're doing with our land? They haven't. They, I was just are, told. I don't, I don't know who the they are. Here, I'd like to know who the they here's are. Here's what happened. You go on and do the permits on the website. Now, you can't go face to face like we used to. Everything was running smoothly. Next thing you know. It was halted. So I had to go to the zoning and I said, well, why I'm going to the zoning? And I, I know the young lady, the lady who was in you know, the, the zoning, he said there was a concern. There was a concern about why we're putting up a fence down at Smalls. That part I heard. But the part I didn't hear was she, they didn't go into any of those who were launching the concern. And I think that details. they need I think they need to come and talk to this body if they have those concerns. Correct. If. Pretty much, I'm feeling confident that after we meet, we'll start breaking ground because the fence would have been up a while ago. But I got to go. I got to run. Through. I, I like your confidence. Yeah. However, again, I'm going to repeat those individuals with their concerns need to come and speak with this body. Yeah. So if they have any concerns, tell them there's a school board yeah. that they can okay. come and have that conversation. And with. I wish I would give you an answer on who did. I was just told that's what was going on. That's why I was held up in the. Uh, the permit because so i hopefully every permit i've been put hear my question yeah. every, and they, if they hear me they can call in every permit i put in for all our projects have gone 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 this was the only one but we're going to get it as a alumni of william penn senior high school and a lifelong city resident of york who grew up in that neighborhood one thing that i do not do and they found that out when they tried to get our land from us to build the stadium and i fought that when it comes to Smalls Athletic Field that was bequeathed to the York City School District. Yes, sir. They know how I am. I have pit bulls and I will be a pit bull when they come to try to mess with the land and what happens there as it relates toward the school district and our children. So, again, you let those with those concerns know that Mr. Breland said, come have a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And this body. And they make no bones about it. Didn't make none then, don't make none now. Mm -hmm. And my position hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. So there's where we're at. So hopefully, Mr. This is Muldrow, where we're moving to. Mr. Muldrow, I just have one question. Am I on? I don't sound okay. Um, or Mr. White, you had mentioned um, about the ability to have, with this being done, the ability to have multiple events. How does that impact our, our parking? Um, space available parking. Not that we need to fix it, but do we have adequate space to have multiple events going on? Oh yes, we uh, yeah, we have a very very. I think we have one of the biggest parking mm -hmm. lots for availability for sports uh, around. If you go to a lot of school districts, everybody's parking all over the place. We have a, a huge lot up top here, of course. That's where everybody will still park up top, and uh, it it, it I, 
I bet we get three or four hundred cars in there. Mm -hmm. and, and Mr. Muldrow talks about, you know, playoffs and stuff. That's all secondary. Primary is for our kids to play and get out and do their studies, get home earlier. All right. So we can the, the purpose, I think, is to get them in and get them out. We can get them in early. They can go home early, do the work or go to work or do whatever they have to do. We can get multiple games going on at one time. They can practice and play at the same time. We don't have to wait for, for, for sports, varsity sports, to get finished before we can go on the field. Now the hard questions. Let's get into financing. Can I ask one more question? Go ahead. We get, um, shoot, you made me forget what my question was. Um, oh, 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 oh. What is the time? What is the potential timeline? If we get all the, the, the agreements and, and the, the go, what is the timeline to getting this done from start to completion? I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Muldrow, 17 to 20 weeks. 17 oh. No, all of it. They're ready to go. Again, it didn't take that long when they redid York High. Yeah, it's when they it's a long time to do York High. <laughs> But when they do this, when they do their survey, they bring their engineers and everything. It doesn't take that long like it used to be. So that's we're looking at when we had our last meeting with them, breaking ground as soon as the last activity is done down there, starting to break ground if approved and if finances. So again, talking to other school districts who have worse situations than we had, it didn't take long. Southwestern put their field in. I, I was down there for a um when they first put their field in, I was down there for a conference with PASBO. Everybody was talking about when they put their field in. They put their field in within two weeks because of what they had. So it's ours is 17, 18 weeks. Now, we may not use it before when football season starts, but you'll have, we'll have it done and ready to go. Again, things do happen. <laughs> things happen. But that's what they're giving us right now. And as far as, far as the price and Mr. White, Mr. Fitch, Dr. Fitch, I think we're locked. But the, the, what you want to hear is we're locked into that price. All right, am I correct? We are locked in, like our roofs. We're locked in. It is not going up. We're locked in. We could take some off of there and come in, make, you know, do it by less. But right now we're locked in. So my questions as they relate to financing are the first is this what would be the impact to the taxpayers? have any change in the impact in any impact to the taxpayers um mr breland because we're already there so we're not really doing anything elaborate or going up or anything with any buildings we're already there so i don't think i have any impact on our tax base at all and somebody okay. can correct me if i'm wrong but so I'm mr sure. hayne let's talk about where's mr hayne he's over there let's talk about this in terms of the impact that will not have in terms of our borrowing and where this money is coming from and how we're going to finance this endeavor. Excuse me. Yeah, that's what I'm, well, I am I understand, but we're talking about it now and I don't want to have to revisit this again so we can get it out while we're here on the, on the field doing this now. That way we don't have to revisit this during finance. So you're asking how much the estimated cost? The cost, okay. I mean, okay. I have so some specific concerns also. as it relates to impact on taxpayers or if it would it right. make any or not. We, we as a school district are tax exempt. So it's, it's not like we're going to pass on this cost to the taxpayers. Uh, it will be included. What it will do to our fixed assets is increase our fixed assets so that we can um, depreciate those over a longer period. Um, the only thing that we, we do pay taxes on um, is a, a little piece of, Ham I think it's Hamilton Avenue, where there's the cell tower. Uh, and that little piece of property is the only thing that would, um, is, is we are liable for tax-wise. This would not change anything for uh, the district. I'm asking that because some of my retirees who live on my street, those are some questions and concerns that they have. Correct. Yes. So this would not impact them uh, tax wise. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so we are we all right. So we can go on to the okay. Anybody else have any questions in reference to the field itself? In relation to what um, Mr. Breeman, President Breeman said, so we can use some of the bond, um, ref, uh, the money that we refinance for the bond uh, for this project here. Yes, yes, director. Yes. So will, will that? So a huge piece of that money is coming out the bond refinance. Correct. Okay. I don't know if the new board members know about the bond refinance. We probably talked about it, but we can talk about this under finance when we get to that report. Okay. Okay. Can we uh, go to the next page, please? It didn't go. Oh, okay. Oh, it's over there. Okay. I don't know. I hear something. It actually feels good to me. Oh, hot. Actually, I think it feels I feel it feels good. It does, right? I, I agree. I made my because I'm in a hot seat. Now. I feel is he coming back? Okay. All right. Auto oh, did uh, strength training. I, 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 okay. Well, no, nope, that's not it. Yeah. Overall, I just hope that this really has a large impact on our student participation and we'll get them out there and get them involved. Yes. That's, and one of the things, too, is that we're always having people talk about us throwing money at things and not be, believing that we are having the conversation that we need to have about being fiscally responsible because we are still in recovery. Mm -hmm. And that will be one of the things that they come up with first is. Why is the board not asking these questions? So part of the whole um, upgrading system is we, our weight room is antiquated. Um, I think that from what I've, from what I've heard and when I talk to the, the uh, teachers and the staff that's been around longer than I have, uh, nothing has been done in the weight room for at least 20 years. If you go in down, if you go down in there now, you can see a lot of the equipment is just old. It doesn't work. Yes, sir. Well. <laughs> 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 Mr. White. Mr. White. <laughs> is part of this now in this overall? It's yes. Building? It's um. It's in. It's okay. towards the back. It's. Did you separate it? Okay. It's separated, so it's in the back part. Yes. All right. Uh, first part of the upgrade would be lighting upgrade, which is starting to take now, taking place now. Justin, want to speak to that a little bit, please? All right, so I can speak a little more to this project. I've kind of been handling this portion of it. Um, we've been working with Mr. Muldrow uh, to work on some of the upgrades to the lighting and the audio visual equipment that we have down there. Uh, currently, uh, we have nothing for uh, audio except a cassette player. So that's basically what teams have to use when they go down there. Um, the lighting is all... Um, old uh, halogen bulbs uh, with no protection. Basically anything that hits them, they will shatter and it puts glass, it potentially put glass all over the floor. Um, yes. Are our, are our guys working on the lighting or? They are. It's they all, are. Yep. It's, it's, our, it's, in, it's, it's in sourced. Yes, everything's being done in house. Um, yep, so we're taking all that in house. Um, like Mr. White said, we got some numbers on our equipment. Basically, nothing has been upgraded in there since 2000. Um, we currently have some pieces of cardio equipment that were put in in 1997, 98. Um, and then we do have some equipment that's a little bit newer, but it is, it is all used uh, resource, 
reused equipment from gyms that closed, things like that. So it's second source to us. It's already been put through a long life. Um, so we don't get the best lifespan out of it. Um, so what we're looking to do is upgrade all of our equipment to be able to house multiple teams at the same time and be user friendly. So we're not fighting between teams who's in there who, um, at the same time. Basically, we want to separate it out. So we have a strength training area, a cardiovascular training area, stability, agility and, and plyometrics and be able to do circuit training. Slide, please. Uh, we are working with the, in our existing footprint. Um, if any of you have you've been ever been down there, we probably have one of the largest spaces I've seen in a high school uh, for weight training. Uh, so we definitely have the space. We just need to upgrade some of the equipment. This is, like I said, the same layout, just with all of the updated equipment in it. If, if you've ever been down there, this is the uh, Beaver Street side. Back door on Beaver Street and over here at the high school area. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, this is the Beaver Street side. So this is the street entrance to, to the weight room. And then over here is the back entrance to the that goes into the school. And that's that whole area. And these are the bathrooms that are there down there presently. That whole uh, space is is humongous. And it and it really will benefit our kids. Like we talked about when we had bickering between teens. Who's down there? Who's not down there? There's enough space down there, down there that they can separate, especially when you need uh, um, core strength training, you want heavy weights. They, we'll say the football team. They can go in that area. Uh, the track team go in the area and use um, lat machines and cardiovascular and stuff, and, and, um, machines, and so on and so forth. Mr. White and Mr. Sowers. I mean. My question is this, in terms of the weightlifting and the monitoring of our students, in terms of their uses of it, because making certain that we're covered in terms of issues of liability. And I asked that for a number of reasons. I was a certified personal trainer as well as certified aerobic instructor. So I'm asking in terms of our children being safe and making sure that they are properly monitored when they're in that space. And, and it still shows you, look, when you ain't the only one with some guns, but. <laughs> you wanna speak that? I'll, I'll let Dr. Fitch uh, chime in on that, please. Thank you. Um, appreciate the time. Yes, we, we definitely have, and we, I'll talk with our solicitor that we have insurance for students we covered. Um, Mr. Sowers also, he is um, a physical education teacher. So he definitely has the background. So is uh, uh, A.D. White, who is uh, also a certified um, instructor. So we definitely have the capability to make sure, but then also when the equipment comes, it's gonna come with some um, how-tos on what we need to do. We have to train our students. And I, yes, I said train because they have to understand what we need to do. They have to understand because you can't get hurt lifting weights. And I'm, I'm, and I got a torn rotator cuff. Yeah, I'm going in on Thursday, but that's all right. It's going to be all right. Okay. I'm going to, can I keep it real? There it is. So I know pain. No, but, but here you go. But this is what we need to do because we need to have our healthy kids come in. And, and I know I don't want to steal Dr. Barry's thunder, but we have something coming up that we can really look to enhance the equity between boys, females, and males, have a way to give them some nutritional value, have a way to get them healthier so that then they can come to school more often, hopefully won't get sick and get everything together. So we have some plans in place that we're working on, but more importantly, the design of this weight room is, is critical because it can hold multi things going on at once. You have to have the adults there at every station. We'll make sure that's covered. And we'll make sure that, again, all of our students are safe and making sure that they, everything goes well. Question in terms of the use of that space. And I believe I may have asked you this question, Mr. White, and meeting with you in terms of, is this space gonna be available for other uses in the school in terms of gym classes with conditioning and weight training? Can Definitely. you talk about that as well? Definitely. Um, Mr. White keeps telling it, talking about a 6A program. A 6A program is a top of the line program. Now, even though we are in the inner city, 
we expect and we have high expectations. So when we demand the best of our students, we're going to give them the best. We're going to hold them to a higher standard. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that they're mentally healthy and physically healthy. We're going to work with the trauma that they're under. So we're going to make sure that we get them to that next level. So when we talk about a top of the line program, that's what we need to have. So we're going to be talking about health and nutrition. We're going to be also talking about just how to ensure that the work that you have out now, your work ethic and your healthy habits that you use, you need to continue those for a long life. So that's how we're going to continue to have that. Now, with that being said, it's, it's going to take a lot. And again, I don't want to steal Dr. Barry Stunder, but we have some things that we're working on. Fitch, Dr. Fitch, and I'm glad you're doing females. You said we're looking out for our females. Yes, we're Title IX. Talk about our males. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm going to tell you now, um, and males. again, um, Coach um, Glover called me and said, hey, Fitch, my um, pass key isn't working. Now it's Sunday. Coach, what you doing? Now I got five girls that want to work out. So you see the desire there. You see the passion there. We just have to feed it. We just have to continue on. And that's the type of level because um, you have coaches that are getting paid and they're working all year round. They're working all year round because that's what it takes as a 6A program. It's going to take that commitment. And that's what we're trying to foster. You put the bar high, they'll raise the bar. And they'll meet that and even go further. This is Ms. Thomas. Can I go? Thank you. Um, so is there going to be signage up at each station explaining to the kids what to do and how to do in terms of the equipment? Yes. Okay. But so we're going to be working yeah. out. Yeah, so I can speak on that a little bit. The new equipment that we are purchasing, each machine actually comes with a diagram of the proper way to use it, the warnings. So it lays out everything, as well as that stuff that we can post on the wall throughout the room, safety warnings, things like that, as well as having our supervision, our coach down there. Um, there shouldn't be anybody in there unsupervised. Um, our goal is to be able to run and do things for both our male and female athletes the way we have it laid out. You can do a plethora of things and it's not just set up for strength training for one particular team. So it really benefits all student athletes of York High. Yeah, so during the day we do have strength training classes that are built into the, the physical education curriculum. Um, they are smaller groups, so it's able to be supervised uh, more closely, but there's always a teacher there. And the first thing that they do before they even start the class is to learn about the muscle groups, how to properly use them and what the equipment can do for them uh, in a positive way. And to show them if you use it incorrectly, this is what can happen. So it kind of ties in with both the health curriculum and the phys ed curriculum. Follow up, my follow up question to you all would be this in terms of our alumni, because, you know, we have a lot of prestigious athletic alumni who may also want to come in and volunteer to work with students and help them. And so are we reaching out to try to build up that forte? Because I know that. Yeah, so I would call him out, but I know he'll be in there because his nickname in school was the beast. But <laughs> So, but hopefully our, our alumni could be a part of that and helping young kids see the value of taking care of themselves. And that's what I say. Yes, we have to be careful. Well, that's why I'm asking. Right. We have to be careful of who comes in there and when and when, where and when they come in uh, because of our student population. So we have to be mindful of, of we are going to let people in to help our kids and maybe to help themselves. They will have the proper clearances. But I'm asking that question because once they know about the new facility, mm -hmm. they will come with that request. Right. So I want to make sure that we're ahead of that and addressing it beforehand because I know it's going to come. And I have seen already. I was down there um, last week uh, trying to help myself. Oh. <laughs> 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 hey, would it go well? <laughs> I think I don't know. <laughs> I need some help. <laughs> I need some help. <laughs> and we had some of our past students in there that just graduated a year or two ago. They come back from college because college break. 
They were coming in and helping out Proc was with them. So that, those are good things, you know, for our kids to come back and to see our other kids and see them also, especially the ones that just graduated. So in regards to the alumni, because I know that we have some staff who have a workout group. Yes. And they go down to work out. So. And, and from what I understand, and prior to where I got here, so I can only speak about what I've been told, that like it, it was a, it was too open before. So we had, we allowed too many people in there. So we got to be, we got to be mindful. If we're going to spend the money yeah. for something like this. We got to take care of it. And I can speak to that too. It was a huge, huge problem. Uh, when I came over here in 2015, everybody's mother's brother's cousin had a key to that room. And I drove by one night at nine o'clock and the, the door was open. And I parked my car and said, what are you all doing in here? And none of them were York City students. So we have to be very careful with that. And, and especially, you know, we want alumni to come back and work with our kids and help. But we also have to make sure that they understand what they're doing in terms of weight training so that they don't right. show our kids something the wrong way. And then someone winds up getting hurt. Or getting so we're hurt probably going to have to put something together uh, along with Mr. Ghetto in terms of release and liability and things like that. So it's, it's not that we don't want to, you know, be a part. We are a part of this community. But we, we have to look out for our kids and we have to look out for ourselves that That's because right. one of the reasons this weight room is in the state that it's in is because it was abused. And we don't want to spend the money and have that happen again. So that's why I asked the questions as it relates to liability. Right. Because I know there have been some practices. Right. That weren't always monitored. So hopefully that is going to the wayside. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Fitch and Mr. White, as you can attest, as we get older, we still think we could do things. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and we got to remember, we just can't go over there and pick that up like we used to. Exactly. And I don't know if Mr. Muldrow can, can, can speak to this and wait till he's finished talking back there. We, um, we talked about May having using key cards that we now get into the building. Is that possible? Okay. So that could be a source. It's for to, just for clearance to get in. Then you'll know who's coming in and out. Yeah. Okay. Because you'll need the card to get in. So at this point in time, shouldn't it only be coaches or staff who have those that, that access? But it's key access too. So right it now, it should be. It should be. But is it? Like I said, I've seen some young men in there the other day. But like I said, they were coming back. But the door gets open. So is that exactly. so? So that. But that's also another concern that I have in terms of safety and accessibility to the school yeah when the proper security is not there yeah so, so and, and that's what happened like, we took the handle well, when i got here in 2015 I, well anyway we took the outside handle off the one door because like i told you i drove by and it was propped open it was nine o'clock at night and i was like get out and they all looked at me like i was nuts but i made them get out but um that that's the problem so we're really going to have to um help everyone understand that when they're in there, you can't open that door and let someone in, you know? So I don't know if we're going to need to put a camera on that door or whatever, you know, we may have to look at what we're going to do in terms of security. The door. We need to know who's having access every single day, every single time right. so that that issue doesn't come up. So we need to make sure that that is put in place. Right. Yes. So, yes, ma'am. As our money uh, watchdog here, do we have the money to do this? Do we have it? We don't have all of it yet. Uh, we're hoping y'all find people. <laughs> we'll help us out with it. <laughs> we are, I've, your um, certain um, machines through grant. Uh, so I have one just come in the other day and I'm, um, myself and Justin are going to pick up two more plus some, some dumbbells from a, from a, the benefactor that's going to and it's going to be brand new stuff so so we could duck some stuff off of that but for the most majority of stuff well dr fitch you want to address some things for me please <laughs> sure. yes we, we hopefully are coming to the board to make sure that we get this completed um i believe we have our building funds that there might be some uh capital camp capital funds that we might be able to look at and with your blessing, we'll be able to get some things and put it in place. Because again, we're trying to revamp what's happening and the look of it and how you can be an urban school, but have top quality equipment. 
because you guys already have it. The things we have now that are 10, 15 years old are still viable because you don't get poster makers the size that you get. We just have to maintain them. That's all. And that's what we're trying to do now because we are looking at hopefully some other things to, again, enhance our 6A program. Because when you feel good, you do better. So in enhancing our 6A programs, and we're talking about pouring this into athletics, and we're talking about the capital fund, and we're talking about all these good things. So we still have sitting over there a swimming pool. Mm-hmm. that has not had anything done to it. And when we take a look at how do we generate revenue and re- generate fund, mm-hmm. it would be very easily to take the diving tank out and then lengthen the pool so that the pool is of size and quality that could be used for swim meets because we used to hold some of the top swim meets in this county mm-hmm. at William Penn Senior High School. So if we're going to be talking about upgrading our 6A programs, then we need to be all encompassing and taking a look at that whole endeavor. Mr. Breland, that's a great idea. That's something to consider. However, we also have a partnership that many times they're using at, um, I believe the boys, is that the boys and girls, the Graham, Graham Aquatic Center. So, I mean, we can I definitely understand look at the Graham Aquatic right, Center. Right. And we don't have the access that they say we have. Okay. Trust me. I know. All right. So when I'm talking about how we're going to broaden and strengthen our programs, then we mm-hmm. need to look at the holistic picture because one of the things I will not be a part of or agree to is filling in that pool <laughs> and taking that space. Okay. So as All a right. William Penn alumni, that that's just a dead issue for me. All right. Okay. And a lot well, of we, we would have to see how much it would be cost efficient wise and and do a study on that because i believe they tried to do it before and i believe it was sort of astronomical it was, in, it was not being done by the school district itself it was being oh. done by an outside group okay i was that, that, that i didn't I that i did not know thank, thank you for the clarification i don't know miss thomas did you want to speak on it the outside group had done a study and uh the current size of the pool right now doesn't meet the today's standard. So there would have to be a, it would be a major undertaking. You're talking many millions of dollars. The cost is probably going up significantly. So we'd have to find the original study and, and probably bring somebody in to, to do some more research to see if it's even viable. Because I, my I understanding the was the space, the, the original pool right now does not meet the specifications for PIAA competitive no, swimming. Because the diving tank, once you take the diving tank out, and you take the middle part between the diving and the walkway out, it would be of adequate size. I was on the swim team. I understand the, the swimming pool in that layout. You'd have to find the old report and then check the, the, the latest standards before yeah. we, we went yeah. down that road. So it would require some research. I'm asking that, I'm asking that research be undertaken. Okay. Mitch, yes. Uh, coming back, you and Mr. White, coming back now to... Uh, the money part of this. Yes. You say you all are looking at grants. Correct. That will loop this down a, a, a bit. And that's that's good news. Um, I like what I'm seeing, of course. Mm-hmm. If this weight room turns out to look as magnificent as our cafeteria. Yes. We got to go. We have a go with this. I yeah. think that because I believe our, our students deserve it. Mm-hmm. Our students deserve yeah. it. Like you say, 15, 20 years old, my goodness gracious. Yeah. Yeah. But then we got to make sure that our kids, too, are held responsible. And there you go. And they're going to take care of all of this that we're doing go. for them. Yes. That's the first priority. There. Yeah. I understand, I understand what you have. They, we put all this I'm, money in mm-hmm. taking care of them, giving them good, solid equipment and safe areas yes they've got to be responsible also yes ma'am yeah and miss or you hit on a space you said safe and, and you're I, I oh okay um, I'll, I'll address that as far as um the timeline when would when, when do when's the visionary date we're looking at to have this project completed just you know yeah so um right now the lead times are a little lengthy on some of the equipment uh, we are looking anywhere from 12 to 16 weeks for delivery. We did just order the initial lap machine to kind of 
uh, test out, see what we thought of the quality. And that only took about four to six weeks, I think, to get in. So our sales rep is telling us that it's usually uh, quicker than what they're quoting, but they do, do not want to like overpromise us. So they're quoting 12 to 16 weeks. Um, I don't know. Yeah, the uh, lighting and the sound system have already been ordered. So I don't know. Do we have lead times on that at all? Okay, no lead times. Yep, so it is in the system. And uh, just to touch on what you said, Ms. Orr, um, we are looking at not only, like we said, doing the equipment, but also adding some life to it, making it look nice, putting some pride into it, and trying to draw students in to participate and up our participation rates. So we're looking at putting paint up, the lighting, the sound system, and trying to entice student athletes and just our student body in general to come down and use it. So, yep. And we're all, and like Mr. Muldrow said, we're doing that all in-house. So. You can no longer use the facility. It's just that simple. We want to be banned. Yeah. As I was saying before, as you were saying, safe. We, our building is really a safe space for our kids. So the more they use it, the more they can utilize it, the more they're off the streets. You know, we have a place for them to go, something for them to do. Anybody, any other questions? Yes. Mr. White, just to... We were we were speaking that we were we were kicking that over. So there are there are some equipment in that in that uh, area that we thought maybe we could move some to maybe to Hannah Penn or maybe some upstairs and put it. We have an area above the, the gym and we can move some of that equipment up there for other use. You know, if the kids don't want to come down or, or maybe um, phys ed class, they could go upstairs instead of coming down into that area and move it. The stuff that we feel is safe and it's still usable. We have thought we, that's what we thought we could do with it. Director Kennedy, we actually had talked about this a few years ago, pre-COVID, about taking that space upstairs and, and making it sort of like a mini weight room so that you could have two gym classes at the same time. Um, I believe they did the electrical work already, Rich, I think. Yeah, they did some of the electrical work already, but then it kind of just fell by the wayside with finances and everything, so... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we do uh, utilize upstairs now. Um, for for instance, like today, when it's inclement outside, batting, we have a batting cage up there. They, they have softball and baseball utilizing during the winter programs for preseason programs. They use softballs, not using the hard balls to, to tear things up. The balls are softer that we utilize that space right now also. We utilize that space. And I love the, the plans and everything that we're putting out. But the number one concern that I have is current gym classes and how they're structured. Because I've been there and I've seen them. Who is going to monitor upstairs when I see there is a number of kids upstairs and there's no adult supervision up there. And those are kids who are supposed to be in gym class. And those are some of the kids who come in, in gym class. So when we talk about having a safe school environment, we will be remiss not to talk about those things because now that has not been a part of the conversation, but it's a part of the everyday occurrence at the high school. So how do we monitor and keep that place safe when kids are going where they're not supposed to be? So that needs to be a part of this conversation. Are you talking about downstairs or upstairs? I'm talking about both. Oh, okay. Downstairs. I think downstairs, the key card system will definitely help. I know we installed that upstairs in, into the gym from the second floor, and that has pretty much eliminated anybody being on the second floor during uh, phys ed class. It has made a huge difference. Um, now we can have the classes on the first floor. We don't have to worry about people that being on the second floor that aren't supposed to be there. If we take a class upstairs, we can ensure that it's only our students, um, that we don't have the influx of students coming in from the hallways, which is what we were having. Um, do you know, when did we install that system? Probably yeah, September, October. Yeah, September, so we, October. We, so. we installed it in September and October. And I'm almost a regular at the high school. And every time I'm there, this is a concern. So we have kids who are letting other kids in where they're not supposed to be. Again, that's a concern. I understand. And I don't have a problem with the things being up there. I would love them to be up there. But my concern is 
how do we manage and regulate that so that we don't have the kids everywhere and anywhere. And it's an issue that continues to create concerns for staff, students at the school, because they speak to me about it every time I'm there. Yeah. No. I'm not one for just trying to sugarcoat things. Reality tells us something different. And I'm there. I see it for myself. So I don't need anybody to tell me. I see it for myself. I think the downstairs area is a lot more secure, as you probably know, than the upstairs area. And that's something we'll have to work on. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just an over, just, yeah, some renderings. Okay, so we can continue, please. Just some of the renderings that are going that are being shown. Yeah, no, I got some mess up, I got things. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I guess we're going to the next topic and what's the next topic for me? Spring Yeah. So today, today is the uh, first day of spring sports. Uh, it's the first legal day for spring sports for our kids to, par, uh, to play, play and practice. So we have baseball, softball, boys and girls track, and junior high boys and girls track as well. So today wasn't a great day, but they're, uh, they're utilizing the, inst today's a prime example, they're inside the building because of the rain. So they're inside uh, softball and baseball upstairs, track and fields all over the place. They're in the gym and in the stairwells and everywhere else. So that's a prime example of how we utilize the area even in the spring. And I think that's it for me, is that right? Any other questions after my presentation is over? Hi. Yes, ma'am. Um, girls softball team, mm -hmm. do they have the needed equipment that they need for? They need, band? and I'm gonna say, um, equipment that they are looking for are things that usually the students get themselves gloves, spikes. Other, other than that, we we provide. Okay, because we just uh, they're He's asking. he's being nice. <laughs> he's being nice. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so we bought last year complete softball uniforms, everything that we would normally buy for a team. They have everything that they need. Okay. So what they what they are asking for additional are warm ups, which is not something that we generally buy for softball. And they're asking for gloves. So and cleats. So we don't normally buy cleats and we don't normally buy gloves. Now we we are open to maybe helping with gloves if we need to, but we need that's a part of what you need to play. That's a part of what you are supposed to get. So we're not buying the whole team gloves and the whole team cleats because that's just not what we do. I, I wasn't told what they needed. Mm -hmm. just... They don't need anything. They want. They want it. <laughs> they okay. want. Well, the next time that comes to me. I'm yeah. Gonna say just that. <laughs> yes, they want. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. It would be nice if we yeah. could afford, but we bought them right. entire. They have so brand the necessary stuff. everything that we would buy a team they got okay. and they didn't even have a season last year. Yeah. Yeah. So they've got okay. this is brand new stuff that yeah. hasn't been used. OK, OK, thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. That. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Yes, that is my report. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. Thanks, right. mm -hmm. Any other questions for Mr. White before we wrap up the athletics? I did want to point one thing out, Mr. White. Um, I know from, from our conversation, and I see it here on the quote, that the quote was good until March the 31st. Just Is that, that still that's true? Mm -hmm. Okay, just wanted to mention yes. that. Yes. And some of those, like I said, we, uh, I was able to, to acquire some things. So the price that's quoted in there will probably be a little less because of some of the things I was able to, our department was able to get extra. Okay. 
donated. Okay, that mm -hmm. concludes uh, the athletic report, Mr. President. Thank you, Thank you Madam Glover Brown. <clears throat> Moving on to our buildings and grounds, Chairwoman, Madam Liggins. Uh, this is Director Liggins. Um, all committee members are present. And um, can you, at this time, I will call on Mr. Haynes to give updates. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Director Liggins. Uh, what we have is a couple items um, on our uh, discussion um, agenda. Uh, the first one being uh, the district-wide and uh, uh, in conjunction with uh, HR Bernhardt and I, um, we looked over various quotes that we had received and we are recommending um, the, um, let me get to that, uh, the AED brand Zoll AED Plus Semi-Auto AED. And these are 28 units. Um, and we, what we have found is that the older, the units that we do have in the buildings are older. Uh, we can't get parts uh, replaced. This would bring us up to uh, a quality assurance AED and um, be there in the event of any uh, catastrophic injuries. Um, a question in reference to the AEDs. Um, where are they located in each school? Is it in the nurse's office? Different places. Different. They're in various departments. Okay. So that can be easily. And then I have one oh. other. So, I'm sorry. So, the AEDs we have are actually the original ones we first got. So, they have to be replaced. Um, and we, as a district now, have to report yearly through PIMS where they are. So there is a spreadsheet with the location of every single one. I don't have it right here on me, but they're not all in the nurse's office, but they're strategically placed throughout the buildings, also at Smalls Field as well, so that we're covered. We actually added some more uh, to Smalls recently, too. So, But there, we just can't get replacement parts for anything, so that's why we're making the request. With um, the AEDs um, outside of the SPOs, or of course, our nursing department, who is required to know how to work the AED? Right now, it's just it's the security staff, SPOs, and the nurses, the the CSNs, and the health aides. Um, we can. Every year we offer, and we've offered in the past, uh, the CPR training, and there will be an opportunity for training with the new AEDs because we're going to have to train everybody. So basically what, what I'm, I'm asking people to do is, you know, we probably need some people to be volunteers in each building beyond the nurse, the health aide, an administrator, you know, and other folks that they would be willing to volunteer to learn. But I know there's going to be some training attached to it, so... Um, we'll just see how many people are interested because we can't really force people other than the people who are designated, but because we wouldn't want anyone to be uncomfortable in using it. Both of you, because you asked the question and she gave the answer. That was going to be my question. <laughs> who is trying? So the, the life of these AEDs has been really good because we've had ours for quite some time and they're beginning to become obsolete but when we needed them they worked so we recently had an issue where we needed one and and it saved a child's life so we can't put a price tag on you know so when we bought these you know we were in a different financial space um than we are now not saying that we're, we're rich but Certainly, we, we definitely need to look at the possibility of upgrading because we've had them so long and we're unable to keep them to the level in which they're supposed to be for working. So, When it comes to replacing them, how long would that take to do that turnaround to purchase those new ones? And um, I believe Ra... Did, did they give us a timeline for that? Yeah. 
we could probably have these uh, all replaced and upgraded within two months. Okay. okay. Um, is is that it for the eighties? Okay, and then we'll we'll move on to our our next project um, proposal. Uh, e. F. Smith, uh, there is an air energy recovery ventilator that's needed so that it can bring fresh air into the kitchen area. Uh, it's uh, when Smith roof was done, they had to take that uh, ventilator out. So this proposal then replaces that so that, that we do have continuous air coverage. And um, that would also, you know, take out the bad air and bring in the good. Just a quick question on that. <clears throat> was it that it could not be put back in or was it it, it was down. Yeah, it was aged and and they did not want to put it back in place because it, it just wasn't working to its efficiency. So this project would bring in a, a new, more efficient model and um, be able to bring that fresh air in. Yes. OK, um, our third project is the west side parking lot uh, for uh, across from William Penn High School. Um, I believe this has been talked about in the past and it has just come back up to fruition. It's definitely a safety and security issue. So we're talking about Pershing Avenue and Francis Cor Street. Yes, sir. Um, and what, what, see, um, what H.B. McClure would do is the actual work that puts the poles in, you know, digs up the ground, puts the conduit through, but the district itself would buy the uh, supplies and equipment and they would save a lot of money doing that. Uh, so uh, we would just be paying HB McClure for all the work. And then our guys would actually um, have, be able to install the, the product basically. Uh, and this is this definitely, and what they are gonna add is uh, conduits for security cameras. So that side of the building, for some reason, does not have security uh, uh, cameras set up, and uh, we, we felt that that was a necessary item. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Haynes, I agree with you. That park a lot doesn't yeah. need to be lit up. Correct, yes. When we had that incident some several years ago with that murder and the person being dropped off. Yes, the person being dropped off into the parking lot. I mean, it was total havoc, total havoc up there that night because I, I was there with the gangs and yeah, right. we had to yeah. stay inside until the police could get that parking lot under observation. So that's yeah. very much needed. Yes, this, this is definitely a safety need for our children yeah. and, and our employees as well. So yes. Um, and then our last project actually came to right right before uh, it was about two weeks ago. It was brought to my attention that the fire alarm system at William Penn has been malfunctioning. It is it's going on 17 years old. Um, it's it's creating fire codes that they cannot reset. No so, information necessary. Yeah. Ask me where I was last night. <laughs> at 1130. At the fire. At the fire. So this this system up replacement upgrade would take care of that um, an aging system, uh, so that we can better information and accurate readings wow. for our uh, fire. Um, so those report. God. When we put all this money into these buildings some several years ago, where, weren't any of these areas recognized then? I mean, we put millions, five, six million dollars into pretty much every one of those buildings. Weren't any of right. these things done? Well, the what? Wow. So this is all centered at the high school now. We read it, Jackson, Ferguson, of course. Um, we're just redoing Smith's roof wow. and some other items. It's a, a lot. Cover the problems. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
that concludes my report, unless there's any other questions. Not a question, but a comment. These things are very much needed. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Other remarks from board directors? Any remarks from Dr. Barry? I just have one quick question, Sean. Do we have any lead times on any of that stuff? Like how long will it take for the lighting or any of? Uh, well, some of these items do start in the summer um, and that will be the best. And they generally take um, several weeks to a couple months. Um, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Muldrow left. Um, I was gonna have him address the timeline and um, but he did he did reassure me that the product is out there for these items, uh, and so as soon as we get board approval, we can uh, jump on that immediately. Thank you. I add one other well maybe comment or maybe a question. So we um, the capital fund. Can you hear me? Oh. I'm sorry. Okay, the capital funding that we will get um, in July, if this goes over that time frame, can we look into using some of that capital capital funding money to um, support some of these projects? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So there's yeah. there's no. So as far as cost, we're okay. Right. Yeah, we do have our bond fund that we had gotten. Uh, uh, I would think it was over a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, that's $10 million. It has, uh, it's gone down to nine because the cafeteria project and uh, part of the Smith project was included in those. So that has taken 1 million. Um, part of the uh, resolution to use that bond fund is we have to use it within three years um, or we, we start to pay a little bit of interest rates aren't that great. So it's, that's probably not going to happen, but we still want to fulfill the terms of for our projects. And, and exactly, but we definitely are examining what it is presenting to the board. I do have a follow-up question, but my question is to you, Dr. Thu, and when we're taking a look at the money that needs to be spent and if the district is being fiscally responsible, do you think that these things that we're talking about and discussing would fall into that matrix of our recovery plan and moving our district forward? It's the four projects that Mr. Hain had just uh, shared. Definitely, because it's you're dealing with student safety and and faculty safety and things like that. So those definitely you have to deal with that, and that's part of what the uh, the Department of Education is saying to schools: the money we're giving you, utilize to make sure that you up upgrade your safety and things for the school. Yeah, I'm not mistaken. I believe that Mr. Fit, Dr. Fitch, asked answered a question, but I believe. Ms. Orr had asked a question to you when we were having the other conversation in terms of spending money on our athletic facilities and other things. She was trying to ask a question, but I believe that I don't know if you heard the question. No, I didn't. I was just asking if that was all included in finances, but I see it was, they were separate costs. But since they, um, Dr. Fitch said he's getting grant monies, that's gonna circumvent somewhat into that equipment room. Yeah. I think if they get grant money and everything, uh, we haven't discussed it in cabinet mm -hmm. yet, uh, but uh, um, you're talking about $3 million between the field and the, uh, the yeah. uh, weight room yeah so i think we need to look and see to make sure we have the best bang for the buck and yeah. as yeah. mr haynes said you know what are our priorities as far as the needs right versus the wants mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. so as long as we can uh do that kind of a two-pronged test like i'm, I'm happy with that thank you dr Thill. Mm -hmm. 
And that concludes my report, President Breeman. Thank you, Madam Liggins. At this time, we'll call Madam Wilkes for the cafeteria agenda. Good evening, everyone. Everyone is present. And now we'll hear from Mr. Kamizik about the financial and operational report. Yes, thank you very much. Good evening. Um, so uh, under the heading of catering, we had a little bit of a slow month this past thank month. Thank you, Mr. Kamizik. There you go. Can you hear me now? You have no sound. You're not on mute, but you just have no sound. I don't know what uh, what's going on here. I can't. No, nothing, huh? How's that? Can you hear me now? Here you now, Mr. Kamishek. Can you hear me now? Test, test. One, two, three. Hear you loud and clear. Hi. Awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. So, um, like I said, under the heading of catering, it was a little bit of a slow month for us. Uh, we're hopeful that as things start to open up a little bit, we'll have more events. We only had two events this last month, and it was for breakfast and lunch for two days of administrator meetings. And then we also supplied some uh, beverages and snacks for a parent engagement meeting at the high school. Um, for the after school program for the month of February, we averaged just 28 snacks and 22 dinners uh, daily per school during the month. And we're hoping that that will continue to pick up. Um, our four employees, though, Tammy and Louise and Natalie and Yolanda, continue to um, come together every single day and put in the extra time at the end of a long day to help make sure that those students get fed. And we certainly appreciate all their hard efforts to make that happen. Um, for commodities, um, we uh, used $26,408 worth of commodities for the month and ended with a total of $35,768 in inventory. Um, one of the things that we've been working on also is to uh, increase participation in the high school program, especially in breakfast. Um, last month, we added hot chocolate to the menu for Fridays. Um, and as you can imagine, it was very popular, has been popular. Um, we put whipped cream and sprinkles on top too. Um, last week we had offered chocolate chip pancakes as an option and those were very popular too. This month, um, I think starting on Thursday and then after this week, it'll be every Wednesday. We're also gonna add uh, smoothies. We're gonna be doing a strawberry banana smoothie and a mixed berry fruit smoothie uh, to the breakfast menu for those kids that like their, their meals to go. Um, our limited time offer for March is the Peruvian chicken bowl. Uh, and as it sounds, it is a Latin inspired dish. And basically what we do is we start with a, in a bowl, we start with a bed of salsa, black beans and rice. And then we place a baked chicken drumstick on top of that. Uh, we drizzle it with lime sour cream, and then we garnish it with fresh chopped scallions. Uh, we met last month during our monthly cooks meeting and we prepared and tasted this uh, dish and we think that all the kids are really going to like it. It's going to be in all schools next week, starting on Monday. And uh, that is my report. Thank you for that report. I greatly appreciate it. Is there any questions from any of our directors? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there any comments? <laughs> I just want to say, Mr. Kamishak, thank you for the quality of food that is continuing to come out. And I like the fact that you're experimenting and bringing some different tastes and flavors into the palates of the children in the school district. That's greatly appreciated. And I'm going to have to come and try that Peruvian chicken bowl. Absolutely. 
<laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to make a comment. Our dinner tonight was excellent. Good. Our I'm dinner glad. tonight was excellent. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, that's Dan. <laughs> He's our chef. He does a wonderful job. Yeah. Is there any additional comments from any board of directors here? <laughs> Dr. Barry, do you have any comments? All right. Thank you, Mr. Kamechek. Thank you. Did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. You're fine. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Board President. Thank you, Madam Wilkes. At this time, we will be moving on to our ed programs chaired by Vice President Madam Kennedy. Thank you, President Breland. Um, all committee members are present. And uh, first up is um, Dr. Breland. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Dr. Barry, I'm sorry. Good evening, everybody. I won't be before you long. Um, so at this month's um, Learning Safely update, some things to look forward to. Um, as you can see, we've had some movement on our levels of community transmission for the weeks um, from February 27th to March 5th. Um, Adam, Adams County remains, Adams County remains high. Um, Franklin County has moved all the way over to moderate. York County has moved one notch to substantial. Lancaster County has also moved over to moderate. Dolphin substantial and Lebanon moderate. So it's encouraging. Um, to see some movement in the right direction, still have some work to do. So it's important that we not get too comfortable and that we remain vigilant. So as you see, we've been tracking the COVID numbers from September until now, and this is probably the best month yet so far. <laughs> we're not far in, but I'm hopeful. Seven days in, three cases, we were averaging at one point in September, October, November, and December, we were averaging anywhere from three to five cases a day. And in January, we were averaging between eight and 10 cases a day. So this is certainly encouraging. Um, I'm hoping that when I come back to you on Wednesday, that number would not have moved. Um, I have this little personal goal in my head that we're going to have a school week, five straight days with no cases. We've had four, but um, that's, that's like my little, my little goal in my head. And <laughs> I just need, I just need for us to, to have a positive outlook. So couple of updates for you. Um, we have our next faith-based me meeting on April 5th from 5 to 5 to 6 30. We did postpone the meeting from last month. Well, we canceled it because we only had three people to um, RSVP and we usually order dinner and it's just a lot to order if only three people were coming. So we um, went ahead and said that we would reschedule that meeting. Our next advisory meeting is actually Wednesday night, the 9th from six to seven, and that's a virtual meeting. Um, and the, the state and the CDC has recommended that districts move from a mandatory masking to an optional masking. I have my recommendation about that later. I'll talk about that a little later in my report. And the summer slam planning is progressing very nicely. We are beginning to start posting for positions and we're looking forward to being able to serve the kids this summer. Um, I am seeking yet another grant. Um, myself and Lori Bowman are working together for the next round of 21st century grants. So the only dish, the only schools in the district, well, there's three schools in the district that do not have a 21st century grant. That is Hannah Penn, the high school, William Penn and STEAM. STEAM students go to their home school for the after school program. So because of busing at night. So 
they don't have one, but they are able to participate. So Hannah Penn is the only K-8 school that does not have the grant. So we are planning to write the application to Mira the Bears Cat Scholars Program, which we are running in all of the K-8s now. Um, and then with William Penn, um, Dr. Fitch was talking about stealing my thunder. I don't know if it's thunder. It, it's, it's a thought and it's very difficult because every time that I've applied for 21st century funds, they've changed the rules substantially. So this is probably my fourth or fifth iteration of applying for 21st century funds in my career. I've never not gotten them, but I, I am a little nervous about applying. So there is a, there's about $500,000 on the table for the high school, but um, they have some very different rules than they've had before. One of which that the cohort of kids that enter the program have to remain constant the entire program. So if we start the program in October of 2022, those kids have to stay in the program until May 2020, uh, 2023. And, and then, you know, the next year, if there are some different students that that's expected, but for the whole school year. So trying to target a high school audience of students that I can guarantee are going to be there because unlike any other grant, this grant that is written by the number of students that you have. Previously, you could put together a program, apply for the funds, and get them. Now they're saying you have to apply and you will get $1,800 per student. So the high school is, has, has the size and the volume for it, but I just, we, we don't have really good luck with kids staying after school at the high school. Sure. In regards to that. Absolutely. So when you take a look at what you're offering in your after school program, would that make a difference? Well, it probably would, except for the fact that 21st century is very stringent about what they will allow us to offer. So, so in, the be in the beginning, in the beginning of the 21st century iterations, there was a recreational piece as well as an academic piece. And it attracted lots of kids because there was kind of homework, help and tutoring. And then the other half, you know, the program ran from like three to six yeah. and there was home, there was snacks homework, help, tutoring, and then there was recreation for the second half of the program. And that was very attractive to many of our kids. And we were able to get drones of kids there because they liked that open gym concept. Now they are not allowing us to have that anymore. So I have to find a target audience of kids that I can almost mandate to be there. So what about if they had a performing arts group that would come in and work with students in terms of the theatrical side, the stage crew side, and just doing different things that would target kids? Because I know that that is something that our students desperately want. And I think that it would attract a number of kids that would be able to do a number of things. So just taking a look at I'm, I'm just asking. Oh, absolutely. That. So that may be a possibility, but it, there has to be like a 50 50 academic po po component. Um, and a lot of times we may get some volume, but to get the five hundred thousand dollars, we're going to need like 200 kids. So you do. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at that. To be honest with you, I'm looking at the athletes because right now we have we are all over the place with the athletic program. And I, if I can just be in my element for one minute here. <laughs> so I was working with the coaches last week and talking about this whole concept of a 6A program because that's their new mantra. And, I, and I'm here for it. I, I like it. I think it's a great concept. I think it's a lot of motivation for the kids. I think it's a lot of motivation for the coaches. Hopefully it'll help with recruiting kids to play multiple sports. Um, I'm really excited about it. But that academic component is lacking. And it's lacking because 
every coach does it differently. I'm proposing using that $500,000 price tag to kind of create a cohesive program where each kid is responsible for, I have over there a student athlete strategy. And those strategies consist of four components, which is their conditioning and competing, their dynamic discipline, their acceptable school and program attendance, and then their academic excellence. Because this, this concept of athletes that are students is, is not in our forefront. It's a student athlete. And so, you know, some of the questions that we were getting along the way when we were meeting with the coaches, well, what about if I have a kid that already has a 4.5 average? I said, well, maybe he can get a 4.8. So, you know, so I, I, I just I really think that that's the target audience because we have the ability to say the, the problem is that historically it's going to be a whole mindset change for them because historically, if it's football season, you go to tutoring for football season and when football season is over, you're free. Right. So then your grades start dropping. We start seeing differences in your behavior. We start seeing you cut in class and hanging out. And I'm using a football team as an example, just hypothetically. That is not what I'm saying is going on with our football team. But I, I'm just in, in this this moment where I feel like we have an opportunity to capitalize off of a huge amount of funds that can help us upgrade and turn our tutoring program into something really high quality that the kids can be proud of, that the coaches can be proud of, and that the parents can be proud of. But it's going to require a lot of buy-in because kids are able to say, mom, I don't need to go to tutoring today. Well, that's not an option because every time these kids, we have to maintain as close to 100% attendance as we can, or we start losing funds because we're getting paid $1,800 per kid for them to be there. And I can't, it's not like we usually every marking period, we can bring new kids in, take kids out based on report cards. We can't do that because they're saying, Hey, this money is allocated for these kids and you can't change them out and you can't add kids or take kids away. So that gives a whole lot of restriction to what you're doing. So you have to find this cohort of kids and kind of calculate just right that you have enough kids to get the money, but not too many kids. So if a couple drop out, you don't lose it. That making sense? It makes a lot of sense. But the focus on the athletes, I like that. Mm -hmm. But would other students be able to participate? Absolutely other students. But but I don't have a mechanism to mandate them. No, not to mandate. I do have a mechanism to mandate athletes athletes, because I can tell them they can't play if they don't come. So I'm I'm nervous. I, I want it to be open to everybody. Anyone who wants to come, I want them to be able to come. But they need to understand that it's a commitment that the district is on the hook for that they have to be there. If not, you know, they'll start subtracting and ultimately just take the grant away yeah. because they'll consider it a mismanagement of funds. Even though it truly isn't, it, it's just we're giving you eighteen hundred dollars for these nine kids per, per kid for these nine kids. And if any of these nine kids are not here for an extended amount of time, then we're going to have to subtract that eighteen hundred dollars for which ones are not here. I guess my question is, so will this be for kids who participate in sports in general? So say, for example, we have athletes who participate in spring sports, Mm -hmm. but we can bring them in because we know they're athletes and we know they're going to be involved. So So that would be a part of what the handbook says. If you are going to be an athlete anytime and it might help us to get kids to play more than one sport, because if you have the kids on the hook in two sports because they want to play two sports. You have them for 50% of the year already. They're mandated to be there for 50% of the year. So the other 50%, yeah, trying to keep them the other 50%. So that's why if we if we have the new weight room, they can do their off-season workouts. They can do, so we, we're trying to make it so it's not, you know, it's something that's feasible for them and we can write into the grant that they will they will have some excitement towards. But it's a it's a different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's much different than anything that I believe anyone is doing. It's very innovative, yet um, 
Sometimes our kids aren't ready for it. They're nervous about it. They're apprehensive about it. They don't like the idea of being tied down. And some of the coaches were had some concerns about losing kids. And I, I will say this publicly, as I did in the coaches meeting, I would rather have academically sound kids that are not winning than right. academic probation kids that are you know, academically sound kids that are not winning than academic pro probation kids that are that are winning. You know what I'm saying? Like, so mm -hmm. I, it's more important to me that their afterlife of high school That's is right. pathway is set right. rather than worrying about the now and being the best team in the conference. If you're the best team in the conference and you do nothing after that, and I'll you don't have anything to for show for it. Right. That's right. So again, that that's a but that's a big that's not just within the kids. That's a community yeah. mindset. But just and so it's going to take all of us to kind yeah. of, you know, start, right. exactly. you know, right. we we want hometown heroes that come back and can tell their stories and that can and that can give, you know, kind of their act that kind of their academic journey as well as their athletic journey. So you know, terms, yeah. I got to go to school free because I was an athlete, I was an athlete right. but I right. kept my grades up right. so I can stay in school. Right. So they got me as an athlete for four years, but I got them for an education for four years. Okay. So well, my follow up question is, as it relates to the weight room, mm -hmm. is there any type of things that we could do district wide to fundraise? Oh, I'm sure there are. Instead of I'm just, sure there instead are. of just looking for monies to give, I mean, I, could, I, I think I think we're going to be able to do some uh, some here. grant writing and okay. but but if we can't get it all in grants, it's, then, it's always an option. Yeah, we can't always get it all in grants. Mm -hmm. But then if we get a substantial amount of it in grants, mm -hmm. then there's things that would be feasible for the board to say, hey, mm -hmm. we want to. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. Mm -hmm. It's kids because. That is something that's continuous. The esports right. kids were there. The yeah. band was there. I had everybody. Okay. So my my estimation of kids is about between 200 and 225. That includes all fall sports, all spring sports, the band and esports. And you, everybody. It, it, it includes everybody. Thank so. And again, the cheerleaders would, would be easy because most of them do football and basketball. So they would already be there. We'd have them. So it's just trying to, you know, brainstorm as a as a leadership team and as a board, you know, how we can roll this out to the community because the parents can help us. The alumni can help us to get the kids motivated to be able to stay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't know who that is. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. You can fix that. I'll, I'll, I'll get you connected. Our uh, advisory committee, is it still Zoom, Dr. Thu? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So our educational, our educator effectiveness walkthrough data, um, as you can see, you're, we're seeing all of the um, amount of time that principals and assistant principals are spending in classrooms. Um, as you can see the um, the dates from September all the way till now. And as you know, many schools like Ferguson are good are really ramping up. Um, well, all of them, really, you can see in the pink. That's the um, the most recent data that was the, from, that was captured on the 23rd. So um, we're seeing that a lot of observations. I mean, walkthroughs are being done. And a walkthrough generally consists of, you know, walking in the classroom, staying anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, capturing some data and providing feedback in the PAE tech system. Mm -hmm. 
it's shared immediately in the PAE tap system. Oh, they do. They have sometimes there there are media conversations and sometimes there's scheduled conversations because missing is when we hear about the educator effectiveness in the walkthrough data, we're not hearing about how that information is being translated and how the conversations are occurring and the feedback. And I think that is a little what's missing in terms of the conversation that is held with us in terms of how that is rolled out and what that looks like. Well, it, it could look several different ways. PAE tap is a system where we capture anecdotal data. So what happens is I go into Miss Wilkes classroom. I stay for 20 minutes. I take my laptop. That is my method. Some principals pr prefer to write. I take my laptop. I capture some of the things that I'm seeing. With me, I'm just kind of looking at glows and grows, and I'm able to give some feedback. And usually with me, I'll have the form up, and I just type right into the form, and then I hit send, and she'll see it immediately. And sometimes they don't like what you write, or they like what you write, and they want to come see you right away. Like, I was that teacher. Like, I, I, I don't care whether you wrote something good or bad. I, I want to talk to you. So I'm trying to set up a meeting because I want to hear what you have to say, not just see it in writing. But some teachers, you know, if you put a, a, a glow down, a, a grow down there that they disagree with or they want to explain. And I, I'm open to hear the explanation. But, you know, sometimes the, the grows hurt. Like when I walk through your room at 915, the students were working and you were sitting at your desk. That's 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 facts, right? Might not feel good, like facts aren't feelings, right? So might not feel good, might not look good on a paper, but that's what happened. So then they want to come and tell you why well, I was there because I was taking attendance. Well, it's 9 15. The kids been here since 8 20. Why are you just taking attendance? So then it becomes this conversation. So sometimes it and, and sometimes it's it's all good conversation. It's I I I walked in your room, Miss Brown, and the kids were laughing and smiling at 1 30 in the afternoon. The energy that was coming off of you and the kids was good. And I could tell that you were having a good time and the kids were having a good time. I didn't see anyone off task, you know. So you you have both. Sometimes you have good conversations. And sometimes you have courageous ones where you have to say, this isn't what I should be seeing. So I'm going to come back because I'm going to be doing this again. And when I do, hopefully you won't be in your seat or hopefully I'll be able to give you more glows than grows. So unfortunately, that's not always easy to accept, but that's the reality. If we want to get better, we don't get better based on what we do good. We get better on the feedback from what we need to improve from, right? So, so and I and and I always used to tell my teachers as a principal, I'm always going to give you recommendations, or I'm always going to give you grows, even if you did a phenomenal job. I'm going to say in the future, maybe you might want to consider. That doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It just means I'm giving you feedback about how you can do better, because that's what we all want, right? We want to know how we can improve. So. Well, Doctor Ray, I just want to pick the brain. Mm -hmm. of an of a principal, a former principal. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna I'm gonna call on you, Miss Thompson. Don't shake your head, Miss Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> because the reason why I say that is because when Miss Thomas was a building principal, we saw a lot of growth from her students and we saw a lot of engagement and we saw a light of excitement from her staff. Mm -hmm. And as a building level principal who can really give this board some information in terms of how they, as that building educational leader, kept their staff motivated and also made sure that the work was being done. And Ms. Thomas, I'm sorry if you if you did a good job and you got to be called on. <laughs> but when you when you leave a legacy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I'm see, what I've seen then and what I'm seeing now, I'm not seeing that same skill translated. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to figure out how are we helping 
those administrators. I know they're going to UVA, but how are we helping those administrators? Oh, they're doing a whole lot more than just UVA. Yeah, I, <laughs> I understand that. that but just when we UVA are sinking did, a ton of time into them. When UVA didn't exist, mm -hmm. we had people who were still performing. Mm -hmm. And Miss Thomas, I mean, that's just one of your legacies. Mm -hmm. So that's why I called on you because you set that standard. And I'm just trying to figure out what do we need to do to set that same spark in some of the principles we have now, because that's not translating. Mm -hmm. Part of it is, um, you know, we've built a, a culture and a climate of trust in, in the buildings that I was in. And um, we, uh, there were expectations, there were standards, there were things you were required to do that were non-negotiables and everybody knew what they were and I understood them and accepted them. But then I also gave them the freedom to, they had input. So we would have conversations about how we would solve things and how we would do things in order to be successful. Um, and then listening to their ideas about how to motivate students and, and the events and things that we did in the past to give students goals to shoot for, to give them goals to shoot for as teachers. And um, just, it was a team effort. It wasn't just me. It, it was a team effort in order to get it done and just getting them to believe in themselves and getting them to believe, getting them to believe, as I always said, would just take the step off the ledge. Like you got to jump. Like Steve Harvey says in his book, you got to jump. You can't be afraid to jump because if you fall, that's OK. I'm here to catch you. And as long as you get back up and we figure it out, we're going to keep moving forward. So empowering them that way and same thing with empowering administrators that way to not be afraid to take the risks and the chances um, and, and build people up so that they they're not, they're not so focused on how is this going to impact me? But what can I do to motivate my students and my staff? to do better. I know they meet with the administrators on a regular basis. Dr. Gloucester has one-on-ones with them. You know, the administrator meetings are very focused and very specific. Um, all the ones I've attended this year, you, you walk away with something that you can take back to your buildings. And then I think the work that Dr. Miles is doing in terms of the educator effectiveness model and using PAE TEP is very helpful. So, uh, you know, I, I think COVID has really impacted people on many levels, mm -hmm. not just academically, but emotionally and socially. And I think for us as a district, it's just been magnified. So I think as we move out of this COVID mindset, this COVID cloud, as I call it, eventually we're, we're going to get where we need to go. It's just going to take a little time and patience and support. And, and Dr. Barry, I, I think too, with this new board and some of the other ones, some of us heard it before. And some of us lived it, but just for the new board members to understand too, when we are concerned about academic improvement in our district, how are our administrators who are no longer in the buildings, how are they still reaching back and supporting the staff that are there? And I know Ms. Nyman has been around helping mm -hmm. people in special ed. Just how do they reach back and continue to provide that support? So in our cabinet meetings, one of our mantras are that we are to be of service for the students and the buildings like we we are here to be of service for the buildings. That is our main job. We, we all have our departments to run. We all have our specific duties. But if a principal calls and I'm, I'm sure you all have one or all of you or, or, or one or all of you have seen. I stop everything I'm doing, even if I'm in the middle of a meeting to take a call for a principal, because that's what we're here for. We're here for the we're here for the schools. So last night when I got a call at 11 o'clock that a building was on fire and the principal was frantic, I got out of my jammies and I got I got dressed and I went over to the Davis to comfort that principal because that's what we do. And so I, I think we all can tell stories about what we do to help principals and to support them and assistant principals as well. Um, and, and that, that is, you know, that is our mantra that we're trying to be of service to schools and, um, and, and, and principals and assistant principals, because we know their work. We know that the trench work is hard. We've all, well, most of us have been there and have done that. So, um, you know, I know sometimes, you know, we have, these high expectations and we're saying you got to do this you got to do this you got but there's some things that we we all need to work on together you know one of them and I, and and it's not it's no it's it's no secret are timelines they have difficulty meeting timelines so we 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 need to brainstorm ideas of how we can work on that and what we can do because if they don't work on their timelines 
then the teachers won't work on their timelines and then the kids won't work on their timelines. So it's this through line from the top down where we all have to model what that behavior is. So Thank you all for your, your explanations, because sure. I'm around the district a lot and Appreciate people the question. don't realize that there's a lot that goes into running a district and people do things on different levels. And I know that our administration is not just sitting down here disconnected from the schools because I've been down here too many times and as they're going through their little series of trainings and things they're having too much fun and mm -hmm. sometimes I disrupt them because they're having so much fun and I don't <laughs> let them have fun without me <laughs> but I, 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 I come down here and I see a lot of promising mm -hmm. and good work mm -hmm. that leaves me uplifted when I go into Dr. Miles's office or Lulu's office or Dr. Gloucester's office and there's a group of people sitting around the table and they're doing some work mm -hmm. so I see it firsthand. Not only do I go to the schools, but also come to the administration building. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of good work going. So my questions were purposeful and intentional. Mm -hmm. So thank you thank for answering them and be open and honest with that. Absolutely. So on the next slide. So you saw the walkthrough data. Now, this is the formal observation data. And um, Dr. Miles has worked with that team very hard to talk about getting in classrooms in this different capacities. So a formal observation is usually something that's scheduled. It's usually an extended amount of time, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour or longer. If it's a whole, some principals want to see with new teachers, I always wanted to see the whole language arts block or the whole math block. I wanted to see what you were doing from the beginning of the block to the end. So I stayed in there a long time. Um, some of them stay 30 minutes and they can get what they need. It's usually a minimum of 30 minutes for formal. And it could be between 45 and an hour. It just depends. And so, of course, because they're scheduled, I, as a principal, would always ask the, the, the teacher, is there anything specific you want me to look for to, that you want feedback on? Because I want to make sure that I'm meeting their needs and what they're asking for. But as you can see, this data shows, you know, strengths and growth. Um, it shows, you know, they the principals get this data. So that tells the principals and the assistant principals that central administration administrators are looking at how many walkthroughs and observations you're doing. And that is calculated into your annual evaluation because part of your job is to evaluate and observe teachers. Looking at here, because I see mm -hmm. orange lines going up and blue lines going down. Mm -hmm. So the blue lines going down represent growth and the orange lines going up represent strengths. So the strengths are the things that the, the principals are seeing within the classrooms that teachers are doing well. The growth represents areas where we still have some growing to do and need some improvement. So they're getting this feedback probably weekly or biweekly from the, the instruction department and they're, ha they're getting individual emails. So it's not just a chart and two sentences. It's at Davis this week, blah, 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 at Hannah Penn this week. So they're getting this information. And again, this information is a part of PAE TEP and is representative to the collective evaluation of each. Principal. So I just want to make so certain that I'm reading this correctly. And when mm -hmm. I'm looking at the data here, the lines aren't mm -hmm. really representative of any just they're representative of the different schools and what needs to take place because I don't see the any, lines where I you don't see, see any 15 growth born, 16 uh, yeah. so the all of those orange lines are representing strength mm -hmm. and 15 is a number of observations okay 16 is a number of observations and then the growth areas the numbers are negative because there's either a lack of observations or what they observe needs growth so that's why i'm asked that's why i Correct. asked the question so i can make certain that i understood what i was mm -hmm. looking at mm -hmm. so what are we doing in terms of making sure that those there is more documentation in terms of what needs to be done in the schools and how are we monitoring that because that's showing me that Yes. Where so this is this is just one piece of data. Okay. The, the slide before this is another piece of data. Okay. And then Dr. Um, Gloucester does the quarterly milestone meetings where it it's 
two principals for the whole ha- whole half a day talking about what's going on. And they, the whole team is there. Every academic area, they're giving very specific feedback. And each one of them gets a report quarterly about what's going on academically, socially, attendance, discipline in their building for the quarter. So that's another piece of data. So that's three right there. Then Dr. Gloucester and her team go out and do walkthroughs with the principals and assistant principals on any given day in ELA and or math. And they give specific feedback and kind of model what they want to see principals and assistant principals doing when they go into classrooms. And it gives them a specific lens. So when you go in a classroom to do a general walkthrough as a principal, you're trying to get your amount of observations and evaluations and um, walkthroughs done. But when you go in there with the math supervisor, you get a specific math outlook. She can talk about pedagogical things that you might not have the expertise about. He or she can talk about um, ways that you can engage students. I was in here for 20 minutes and I never saw one manipulative. Mm -hmm. That's not good. Like, you know, I was in here for 45 minutes and it was a reading class and nobody read the whole time I was in here. So those pieces of feedback you have content area supervisors that are giving the principals so the principals can in turn and assistant principals can in turn take that information and say you know what I'm going to try to provide more specific math or ELA feedback when I go in next time that's a goal so and then sometimes the principals and assistant principals are picking up the phone and saying to the supervisors do you have time to go in with me I'm going in for a formal for Mrs. Orr's class can you come with me and tell me what you see? And I tell you what I see and then I can write it up. So, and that's what we want. We, we want the principals to not be afraid to ask for help because at the end of the day, when you put all of these pieces of data together, you get an evaluation that's reflective of what they've done all year. And are you all finding that with your teachers, with this feedback, that's empowering them to ask questions and, not be fearful of someone coming into their classroom to make an observation or is it mixed? I think we, I think it's mixed. I think we have a long way to go. Um, We were talking to some um, teachers today on labor management and they were uncomfortable with the idea of videotaping and um, pictures. Um, So part of the E3 grant that we have We need to provide some of that artifacts. And so they were like, well, it would be nice if someone would have told us that. But, you know, I take pictures. I've I've taken pictures all the time and and tweeted and done all kinds of things to show them that we're watching. So that's not that's not something new that has happened. But, um, you know, they're getting nervous because you're taking pictures and, you know. And so hopefully we can continue to assure them. So to directly answer your question. I think it's a mixed bag. Some people are confident, you know, you can go in certain rooms all day long, anytime. And they're like, oh, you're here. Come on in. We can't. Well, you want to read? You want to? And, and, you know, I was I was good. When I was a teacher, I was good for putting people to work. Oh, you staying? Because I, 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 I could really use some help with that. <laughs> they're like, what you want me to do? Can you just go over there and make sure that they're reciting the letters? And I'm going to go over here and work with this group. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I welcome people because I always considered it an extra set of hands. So what are the conversations? My last question. What are the conversations on reflective practice in terms of what it is that they're doing? How are they growing from these observations? And how is that observation going to assist them Mm -hmm. with making continued progress in their classrooms? So your question is, what are the the effectiveness of them having some reflective practice? Oh, I mean, I, I, I think all of us can benefit from from reflective practice. I'm not sure that um, everybody is ready to see it or everybody is ready to hear it, but the benefits are, 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 are endless. Like if, if I'm, if I'm saying to you, 
when you sit down and you really think about this, what could you have done differently? You can't just say to me, oh, next time I'm going to use manipulatives. It's more than that. Like we need to dig deeper. Like what, you know, what could you have done for kids that how many kids weren't engaged in your lesson? You ask questions like that, then it, then it's more of a push because because the conversation is not necessarily meant to be comfortable. The conversation is meant to make you think mm-hmm. and if you're a reflective person, that's uncomfortable. If I say to you, how many kids do you think were off task during your lesson? You, you're immediately going to be like, oh, she, she was counting kids. Yes, yeah, yes, I was. And so, and what can we do differently for those, for that group of kids? You know, do we need some more high interest reading materials? Could they have been doing this? Could you have put them with a partner? So the, the, the reflective practice exercises and the coaching is, is our methods to make instruction stronger and to raise expectations. It's never a gotcha. I mean, I can, I can go into a room and, and talk to Mr. Thompson about his instruction and be just as sweet and nice and, and basically say, that sucked. Like, you know, I can do that because I've built that relationship, right? But in, in the end, it's never easy to hear. It's ne- whether it's reflective or whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, it's never easy to hear. And it's not supposed to be because if you're comfortable with something that's not acceptable, then we don't want you here. Like, like I mean, that sounds mean, but, but that's the reality. Like if you don't want to grow, Dr. Gloucester's famous front words, let me help you get where you need, need to, to be, go. right? <laughs> Let me help you. <laughs> well, I just want to say this to you, to the administration, Dr. Barron administration. The teachers that I've visited have been open and welcoming me into their classroom, and they were happy that I was there, and they wanted to see what was going on. And I have not met one teacher this year that I went to their classroom that they were not excited to have someone come in and see what was going on in their classroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So on the next slide, we have some IXL data. You all were gracious enough to um, approve us to to get this program, and it did cost a pretty penny. Um, So I want to give you some return on your investment. Um, I will admit that um, the usage is not as high as we would like it to be um, at some schools. Um, no, it's, it's due to not putting kids on. So, so, uh, we, we, we want to increase the usage and, um, we are going to, as a team, talk about how we can do that this summer. Like, can we encourage them? Cause other districts use it as homework. Like kids have to have so many skills done in a week and they do get some time to do it in class but it has to all be done by Thursday or Friday or whatever the day is. So we want to increase the usage because the research is telling us that the more this is, this is like rote practice, the more differentiated rote practice that they get, it's a, it's an enhancement to good instruction. So if you're providing good instruction and they're getting a tier one intervention that's allowing them to have that reciprocal teaching where they're repeating skills over and over again, we're going to start seeing the bang for our bucks. But, but we have to be consistent with the product. We, we can't expect the product to work if we only use it 50% of the time. Exactly. So we, we have to buckle down and and make it a part of our learning strategy right and that has been one of our issues in this district is Mm -hmm. when we talk about implementing something Mm -hmm. and then the follow through and the sustainability of it and the fidelity of it so when does that non-negotiable when does that become a non-negotiable it's about to become one shortly so Mm -hmm. (laughs) so but you know definitely you know, seeing some some mastery, some proficiency, some practice. Um, we want to see more mastered and proficient than practice. Um, and I think that's going to come with the amount of time you get on. Mm-hmm. Looking ahead, we have some staff development on um, March 9th, early dismissal and um, school board advisory meeting at six o'clock. 
there's several different ones going on. D yeah, <laughs> it's never one thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> That's how principals are informed around uh, the professional development needs of the staff based upon um, what the observations and the walkthroughs have identified as the areas of strength and then the opportunities for growth. So it depends by school. third there's another early dismissal so there's two in march and then um i think we need to have a conversation about this whole mandate recommendation um in in april i personally do not think that we have enough days in a row weeks in a row of no cases to to drop mask i just don't um we are going to get some pushback about it because many of the districts around us are doing, um, what do we call it, um, optional masks. Um, th that's true. That is true. But I just w I want to put the, the true information out there so you know. Um, I personally think that we need to stay the course a little longer. Maybe in May I'll feel differently. But right now I think definitely – through April, um, we need to continue what we're doing because it's rendering better results. So, um, you know, some people agree, disagree or, or, or whatever, but I told y'all that y'all pay me to give you my best recommendation and that's it. So, well, and, I, and Dr. Barry, my, my feeling is I appreciate what other districts are doing, but when it comes mm -hmm. to these decisions, I really don't care what, right, what so, they're doing. Right, right. <laughs> I, I really care more about what's happening here and what's best. Well, what's going to be best for our population? What, what's best for us? Um, so I, I, you already know where I stand. On, and under so. and understand that we are we are one of the biggest districts well, in the county. That's what I'm saying. So our and. We have the the smallest radius, so five to seven square miles versus another district that's thirty square miles. Being condensed, and we're not going to be also Correct. swayed by mm -hmm. political issues. Right, this is a health right. issue. So, right. I, right. so I, you know, I like I said, I just wanted to put it out there and and let you know how I feel and and and, and it's not just how I feel; it's based on what we're seeing with our numbers. We. We showed you the chart and we're just at the beginning of March and it's showing promise. And I don't think we should make a decision based on showing promise. I think we should make a decision based on a pattern and the pattern is something that repeats itself more than three times. So if we have two or three weeks, months where we are seeing numbers consistently dropping, then maybe we can revisit that conversation. And I think even oh, considering we, our, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Marty. Mm -hmm. um our vaccination rate you know among our our students and and staff really should play into that conversation as well push back at all from the kids or is it mostly from staff the kids the kids are being kids we, we constantly have to tell them you know put your mask up over your mask. nose you know put your mask up over your nose they're, yeah. they're walking the hall like this or they're they're walking the hall like this you know yeah. Yeah. um but some of that comes from adults not wearing theirs either like you know teachers you know and and don't get me wrong yeah we're lots of them are over it and i get that but we got to try to stay the course yeah, because, because to me, it's better than them zigzagging back and forth. Correct. If they're used to wearing a mask now, let's don't, you know, right. mess around so. with that. Mm -hmm. Let's just stay afloat mm -hmm. because if the the mm -hmm. numbers are going down, let's try to keep them down. Mm -hmm. I still wear mine when I go out. Mm -hmm. I don't care what CDC is saying. Mm -hmm. I'll put my mask on when I mm -hmm. go out to any of the stores. Mm -hmm. I'm just not ready Right. Do away with and it, you so. and you don't have to be yeah. right. Like, so that that's the good thing. So, yeah. so uh, I'm in a, it's, it's up to you. Yeah. But so, I'm in agreement. right. Keep them on for a while. Yeah. Let's let let's let's wait. <laughs> <laughs>
you pay me to give you the recommendation. You make the decision. <laughs> Don't be trying to put it all on me. <laughs> That's right. We all going to be the fall guy together. <laughs> I, I'll say I said it, but but y'all agreed with it. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> That's, no, 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 not at all. Okay. Um, this is my favorite part of the presentation. I am so proud to see all of our Bearcats that participated in Representative Hill Evans' essay contest. We had several kids that participated and won. Um, from Good, from Davis, from Steam, Hannah Penn, and the high school. So good old Ivy, she's there. <laughs> so um, that's our little boy representative. So yeah, so um, yeah, that's yeah. She's a she is a she is a very good student, a very good student. Very proud of very proud of all of these young men and women. Um, for entering this contest and, and, and then winning. I mean, essay writing is, is, is seemingly becoming an obsolete thing. You don't see kids writing essays like they used to. They're not assigned as much as they used to. So, um, you know, this is, this is nice to see. And Dr. Barry, can yes. I, I, I add sure. one more to that Please. list? And, uh, you're going to have to tell me her name, but the young lady that won the... Um, um, mental health content. Mental health content. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> when I get it, mm -hmm. but um, her her design is being placed on t-shirts. Yes, it is. I when had a picture, out, but I had already had showed y'all. Yeah. So. Um, and the student. I'll put it on Wednesday so you can see the t-shirts. I have pictures of them. Yeah, it's really well, I nice. Have, um, and they should be in. Um, oh, shortly. But I was thinking I would like to do something when when they come out because mm -hmm. her name and stuff is on it, too. Right. So I, I, right. I think is a I, I think is a board that we and can the, do something. And the her. cool thing is she really had no idea that this was a contest and that she could win. So she was just doing this. And and when she found out that she won it, we had the um the video, the the um the zoom video when they told her she won and the expression on her face was just priceless because she had no idea it was a contest and she could win not nonetheless that she was going to be on shirts and she was like but i need to revise it a little bit and they were like revise the one <laughs> go go right ahead so so it was really cool and um and and, and principal um Schweitzer really made a big deal about it and um and and praised her for her her and her family for you know, and so it, it it's it, it was really cool. So really, really proud of them all. I, I am. Um, also, we've had some wonderful things going on up at the high school um, on the 1st of April. Um, 350 10th graders had an assembly with Ellis Proctor and the brothers and sisters um, making a difference. Huh? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> It is, it was on, it was on February 1st. Of. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I'm a little ahead. So, but, um, you know, Mr. Proctor and his team spoke to the students about being confident, walking with purpose. They had sweatshirts that said, I am great. And they gave some of them out. Um, great program. They had, um, you know, some, a, a really good agenda, um, lots of conversation, lots of laughs. The kids were really into it. So congratulations to the 10th graders. And I believe Mr. Little has the 10th graders over at um, William Penn Senior High School. So congratulations to you all for your good work. And then on Friday, February 25th, <laughs> the other one was supposed to say February 1st, <laughs> So we at we we began um well concluded the um Black History um, Month assembly assembly we had musical performances they had dancing they had a fashion show the Temple Guard um many unsung hero awards were given out um earlier in that month they had a um, D nine celebration where the kids got to come around to all the tables of the fraternities and sororities and ask questions and um get 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 um prizes for drawings 
it's just really been a great month to to commemorate black history and to show the kids what our heritage is all about i am you know i am full with um with pride at the talent in our schools and how our kids you know stepped up to the plate and really embraced um they were very well behaved they were very passionate um and and they and they were very curious about black history and and that just made my heart smile it was it was just wonderful to watch and see i am very irritated that my daughter decided to get sick on the friday of the program um i i took my son to the bus stop and she promptly vomited all over everything while i was gone so i missed the um i missed the program but i did get to participate in the d9 event and i did get to um to check out some of the other activities that went on during the month. So, and, um, my Octavia, um, hoodie and yes. her and her committee did a phenomenal job hats off to them for their good work. Um, and the kids are, are still in celebration mode. I, I saw on social media, one of the kids drew like a, some type of, um, like award, like a ribbon that said Black History Month and had all these names of leaders in it and gave it to Miss Hoodie. So they, the kids are showing her their appreciation. And I, and I think that, that that's what it's all about, right? Like that's the stuff that we want to hear about when we hear William Penn Senior High School, mm-hmm. how resilient and how um, supportive our kids are of one another and our staff. It was an excellent program. Mm-hmm. And the teachers were mm-hmm. saying to me, this has been the best assembly that they've seen. Mm-hmm. The children were into it. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I don't believe there were many disruptions. Mm-hmm. And when the one kid was up there rapping, all the students had their cell phones out yeah. <laughs> and, and had the lights going back and forth. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. just the enormity of the talent that exists at that high school. And I think that mm-hmm. as a district, it would serve us mm-hmm. to continue to work to cultivate Mm-hmm. the talent that's there. I just want to make sure that we, we do a better job advertising next year so we can make sure that everybody can participate. So um, because, yes, there was a whole bunch of us that didn't know about some of the stuff. So I want to make sure that, you know, it was it was something to see. So it was. I want to make sure that um, everybody, as many people as possible and, and getting some of our community members to come out, yeah. you know, um, and the parents and there the were, parents, there were yeah, parents and students yes. Yes. in the audience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it would be nice if we can do two showings, like a, a, a morning and an evening. They, so, yeah, they did so. a morning and an afternoon. Mm-hmm. Showing. Yeah. But it would be nice if we could They'll do an, an evening, evening one show. for yes. people who work during the day. So. Yes. Yeah. You can do it. You can do anything you want, Director Wilkes. <laughs> Go shout on. <laughs> um, I just wanted to do a, a shout out to two teachers that are at Jackson Elementary, Mrs. Kim Wally and Paula Feniger. Mm-hmm. I had worked with these two women previously in the class and was invited to come speak to their after school group called Girls with Pearls. Mm-hmm. And I was just able to speak to them about me being raised in this community and being where I got to with um just knowing the people and just being part of an educator and also being a social de- activist in this community. Mm-hmm. So I just want to say thank you, Mrs. Wally, for inviting me. Mm-hmm. I definitely appreciate talking to your young ladies. Mm-hmm. And they were so polite. Oh, so thank good. You. That's great. That's great. So that concludes my report. I, I told a little white lie. I said I wouldn't be before you long. And I'm, I'm going to blame, you know, Mr. Breland Mr. because Pale. he kept asking me questions. <laughs> I'll take it. I, I actually have some questions. You get, you get, I, absolutely. No, 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 I'm, 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 I'm open to any questions. You guys know that. I'm just, I'm, you know, I have to no, give Mr. Breland a hard time. I was on a roll, so I just, I just, I hold mine. Okay. You have to be on a roll because yeah. for one, mm-hmm. I want to make certain that this board is not just seen as a rubber stamp board and that we're truly concerned about what's happening in our schools and what's happening in our community. So mm-hmm. I didn't want to ask questions, but no, I, you all I'm gave kidding me, you, you, you know, you that. all gave me the, yeah. you all gave me the fuel to ask the questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's okay. I'll help yourself. Okay. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Mm-hmm. Barry. All right, board members, there are some other items on 
our agenda that will be up for a vote at our next meeting. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, one thing I will note as it relates to the um, conferences, I'd ask Dr. Gloucester to um, share with us going forward to share with the board for those who will be attending conferences, um, purpose and intent of the conference, as well as um, some attended outcomes and how the information will be utilized going forward um, in the work of anyone who, who is attending conferences. So that information will be forthcoming. Anyone have any questions on any other items on our agenda? Hearing none, Dr. Berry, any final remarks? No, thank you. That concludes my report, President Breland. Thank you, Madam Vice President Kennedy. And moving on, we will be now moving into our finance committee chaired by Madam Moore. Uh, all my members are present. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Haynes though. I think we covered pretty a, a lot uh, this evening with our athletics and then with buildings and grounds. So we'll see what else that Mr. Haynes has to offer and move on. Okay, thank you, Director Orr. Um, the, the first item, I do want to show you a page in the LIU general operating budget. Um, Mike, if you can find that um, attachment. Okay, uh, about page eight. This is, uh, there's a lot of numbers, a lot of information in here from the IU, uh, but I want to point out this is probably the most, right, right there. So this is basically the overview of the 22-23 uh, operating budget for uh, the IU-12. There are 25 participating districts in there. And you can see, uh, you can read there, by state law, the local school district board of directors are required to approve the portion of the general operating budget that's funded through district contributions. So although their general fund operating budget is $8 million, the districts that participate only contribute 1.64%. Um, so I just want to show you that it's not a lot of money, but we still have to uh, approve it um, because we are participating in their programs. Um, that is, that's really the only thing I wanted to show you, um, you know, especially for the new board members. Um, it, you have the opportunity to look over the information. So if there's any questions uh, or comments, and then I could I can take them, but I may not know them, but at least I can uh, find the answers for you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Haynes. Also on the report, so you all did receive your packets mm -hmm. of everything that's listed in our financial uh, goings on. Uh, there's also item 3B, is audit reports from Axelrod LLC uh, that's listed. And we're in the process too now working on our own budgets coming up. So uh, we're gonna be dealing with that in upcoming board meetings to vote on our own budget uh, coming up. Are there any questions concerning our finances? Well, Dr. Barry, you have anything? No. Okay, hey, that concludes my report. Thank you, Madam Moore. At this time, we'll move on to our general policies, chaired by Ms. LaQuinn Thompson. President, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Thompson. Thank you. Um, so the first policy uh, you have is the weapons policy, 218.1. Uh, and then the next one is terroristic threats, 218.2. And then 236.1 is new. So this threat assessment policy has driven additions and changes to 218.1, 218.2, 247, and 249. All changes are bolded. Things that have been removed have lines drawn through them uh, for you to reference and for you to see. Uh, the threat assessment is, is brand new. For us, it's a requirement now for each district to have a threat assessment team. We will be utilizing our, our existing crisis team as our threat assessment team because they're basically the same folks that go out whenever we have a crisis anyway. So um, if the policies are passed, then we'll share that information and I'll be getting with uh, 
Chief Judge, excuse me, Chief Johnson to get that team together to go over the policy 236.1 in depth so they understand their roles and responsibilities. But everything is there in the policies for you to read and review. If you have any questions, just let me know. That concludes my report. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions from the board? Hearing none. Any remarks from uh, Superintendent? Sir. Thank you so much. Mr. President, that concludes our report. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. At this time, we will move. We're going to be going into our executive session to discuss personnel.